Welcome to the Wanderlust Journal podcast, based upon great storytelling. We'll be sharing adventures, recommendations, and tips for the aspiring writer. I'm your host, Sarah Leamy. I am a wanderer since I was a teenager hitching across France. I usually travel alone with dogs and in various vehicles. I'm the author of Van Life, Bring a Chainsaw, and numerous others. And I have a master's degree in writing and publishing, so you are in good hands today. If you'd like to hear more, simply subscribe, stick around, and we'll take you around the world. Why, hello and welcome. Um, today we are going to be doing a couple of stories of hiking. People going out with a backpack and going exploring with their feet. So no vehicle involved travel. Um, and we're going to go dive straight into this one. This is by Sam Blakely. And it is from his uh, book that's coming out with Wild Dog Press. It'll be coming out this summer. And it's about him traveling around New Zealand. Chapter 1. Not goblins like Maori goblins. Beach the gold-bearing province, where the few go from other countries because of the inhumanity of its people, said Marco Polo, quote, unquote, as quoted and erroneously located in Terra Australis Incognita by Gerard Mercator on his 1569 map. So this book is actually pretty interesting because he combines history, he combines the uh, journals of Captain Cook and references a lot of history and a lot of the stories about what um, the first impressions of the local peoples, of the indigenous people that already lived there. And so it's um, it's it's very informative and also in- interesting. So let's begin with chapter one. With my pack on my shoulders as I stroll down the dock, I feel lighter than I have in a while. I'm just thankful to be here. The logistics of travel via plane, bus, ferry and mailboat all drain from me. Those modes of transportation, out of my control and outside my scope of comfort, make me nervous. Will I make the connection? Do I have my ticket? Will weather delay or cancel everything? It stresses me out. Now, moving fully under my own power, I feel that stress lift and float away across the bay. I've got 1,500 kilometres of travel in front of me and all the time in the world to do it and nothing to stop me but myself. No itineraries, no schedules, no incomprehensible delays or infuriatingly tight seats. Just me, my backpack and my own two feet. Free at last. I don't make it far off the dock. There's a beach here, right at the end, of white sand circumscribed with mown grass. There, I take a minute to change into my hiking, or tramping, as it's called down here, clothes, and organize my gear into more manageable form. Clipping the final buckle and tugging on the strap, I leave my pack where it is and wander around. Ship Cove was named by Cook 249 years earlier, almost to the day. He landed here in the Endeavour in 1770 in need of food, food, water and other supplies during his first voyage of discovery. Quote, the bottom of the bay we are now in, we cannot see, although it is very clear in that quarter, unquote, he wrote in, of the area. Unquote. The land is so closely covered with wood that we could not penetrate into the country, end quote. <coughs> Nonetheless, it quickly became his favourite base of operations, and he would ultimately spend almost half of his time in New Zealand in or around Ship Cove. Now a large concrete monument stands to his memory. It's shaped like a truncated pyramid with its top cut off, sort of like the pyramid on our dollar bill in the States, and it is painted white. An anchor sits atop and a cannon flanking either side. And so it carries on from that. It's a mix of his personal journey, which I always like, and... Uh, the history of the country that he is visiting and he is very well aware of um, the dichotomy between the colonial Captain Cook story and that of um, the Maoris who already lived there in New Zealand. So it's a great story for that. There's a book coming out that's going to be around, I believe, 250 pages. I'm helping publish it through Wild Dog Press, Travel uh, website and we're gonna get that out this summer so I'll I'll keep you posted on that so that was Sam Blakely and Sam Brakely sorry bad pronunciation next we're gonna go to Anne-Marie Wells and her book that's coming out again this summer 
It's called Happiness in Iceland. And it is, again, a mix of her personal journey and the places that she's walking through. So this, I love this story because it's so, um, that it's, It's different in that it's written in the past tense. You know, I had said that I would point out different writing techniques or observations from the different things. So Sam writes very much in the present tense of what he's doing and he's going through. And then he saves anything in the past tense for when he's writing about um, Captain Cook and Marco Polo and Maori indigenous culture of that time, the 1700s. And so there's... um, he uses that. He uses the tenses differently for that. And in Anne Marie Wells' book, uh, Happiness in Iceland, she has written it mostly in the past tense. And here we are. We're going to start with what I think is the great prologue. I froze, splayed across the slope, looking at the broken spires of the chain that was supposed to support me. The gravel slope leading to the corner of a cliff slid under my boots, nearly catapulting me into a ravine. I stabbed my walking stick into the loose stone and reached behind me with my left hand, grabbing hold of a rock that sliced open my palm. Who the fuck gets sued here when people fucking die? I screamed into the sky, as empty as the trail behind me. A bead of blood meandered down my wrist as I patted my pants' side pocket to make sure the miniature cinnamon buttons I had stuffed inside that morning had not suffered any injury. I wiped the blood on my pant leg and peeled my rainbow duct tape from my walking stick to bandage the cut. I grabbed hold of the lousy chain again, forcing myself to trust it, despite its recent betrayal. I would know its faults now. Keeping my attention on the sloped ground beneath my feet, I wished I wasn't alone. If I didn't make it safely around this cliff, no one would know. No one would know where to look for my body here. Then, as if the universe had heard my voice, I was not alone. Whoa! Where do you come from? I gasped. The young man with Harry Potter glasses and unkept beard blinked, mouth agape, perhaps just as startled to see my face as I was to see his. I am from Poland, he said. I stared into his face with the rusty chain clenched between my fist. A path about 30 feet long and barely wide enough to fit one foot in front of the other extended behind him. There was no way in hell I was climbing back up the slope I had just come down. Without negotiating, the Polish man and I began switching places while still clinging to the chain. I reached for the rusty links around the corner and pressed my body to the cliff face, forcing the man to pass behind me. His backpack, I reasoned, so much larger than mine, would give him a better chance of a cushioned fall. His nervous breath, much louder than mine, passed behind me. Isn't it amazing, I said, how we're from two different continents, yet everything we've done in this life has led us... To this moment right here, he said, as we stood facing each other from the opposite directions than from that we had started from. Yeah, I said, I think we should kiss. And from there she goes on. And basically the premise of this book, that was taken from further on in the book, but she used it as a prologue. Um, but in this book, I love the combina- the idea that she went to Iceland, she was having a hard time in the States, young woman, you know, I don't know, mid-late 20s, I think, at the time. And she went to the state, it went from the States to Iceland on her own with a backpack and decided that she would hitch around the country. And rather than have a preset notion of what she was doing and where she was going, much like Sam mentioned in the little excerpt I gave you, she decided that she would talk to strangers and ask where they had been happy. And wherever they had been happy, she would head to. And once there, she would get a sense of the place and then she'd talk to someone else and get another sense of talk to someone, see where they had a happy memory and she would go to the place of their happy memory. So I love this. She had um, literally a backpack and a top, top, top all in for those who can't understand my accent and no tent, um, sleeping bag, very few things, not even a very good raincoat. Um, she was not prepared, but she maintains a ridiculously good attitude all the way through. And it's very entertaining and it's a lovely inner journey echoed within the outer journey. So I did want to give you that. Another one I want to give you for is from, uh, let's see, I'm just going to read it to start with. 
In England, we have rambling associations. With sensible shoes, a bottle of water or gin and a sun hat, the ramblers gladly follow paths through fields, up and down dales, along canals and into the softly rolling countryside of Britain, stopping for lunch at a local pub on a canal. However, those ten miles made me light-headed, bright-eyed and wobbly-kneed, as it was instead a five-mile hike, and I mean hike, into the mountains near Wolf Creek in southern Colorado. I'd heard of a remote and primitive hot spring at the end of a trail in the Weminuche Wilderness, Avalanche country. Not then, it was summer. But it probably didn't help that I forgot to eat before I set out. I wasn't in the mood at the time. Up the road from West Fork campgrounds, I'd parked at the trailhead. Yesterday, the firemen had been parked in the same place as there was still a wildfire burning within a mile of my destination, the hot springs. And yes, I craved a soak in hot water with mountains watching over me, fires be damned. All the way I ambled slowly uphill, and the tendons were truly quivering within an hour. The elevation rose a thousand feet, and breathing became laboured. The cliffs dropped on the other side of the steep canyon, and the path turned downwards to the river below, where dunking my head in the rushing water cooled me off, and Daisy would drink another gallon. She was panting so much that I kept dousing her whole body with water just for her to shake it off. We also kept coming across creeks flowing under the mountain path and falling into waterfalls only feet away. It was all quite simply breathtaking to me. With every step I saw asters, sunflowers and penstemons, and a creek crashing hundreds of feet below. I fell into another zone, stumbling up and down the mountainside for hours. My legs ached and stomach grumbled as we came out upon a meadow high in the mountains. The path petered out into various campsites, the rustic kinds that were merely flattened by tents and feet. I headed for the river and saw a little pool someone had built among the river rocks. A logical leap led me to drop my shorts, and I was right. It was hot. Well, it was warm, and it was muddy, and it was not quite the experiential delight I'd hoped for. I stood up. On the other side of the creek was another pool. I scrambled over. Or rather, I gracefully crossed the freezing slippery river. This pond spread two feet deep and approximately eight feet wide. I lay in it, completely submerged yet supported by a perfect boulder for my head. All alone I relaxed my weary muscles, and it didn't take long, daisy long, before she whined restlessly, and I told her to go away. My bum ached, and when I dunked myself in cold water and stood up to shake myself, the biting flies and mosquitoes found me. On the walk back I found a perfect camp spot halfway home. Near the river, but without the pools that mosquitoes love. The site lay smooth, sandy, and slightly hidden, or so I thought. Just as I was full of congratulations for my discovering such a wondrous path, a man in his fifties and his silent young son walked round the corner. Next came a mother and her eleven-year-old son. Later, I bumped into her husband and brother-in-law. So much for my undiscovered campsite. So that book that excerpt comes from bring a chainsaw and other stories from my solo travels and it's one i wrote so it's by sarah Leamy, and it i wrote that from that would have been around 2002 2003 and i think the book was actually published um more like 2010 2012 so it's been out for a little while but people love it it's got stories from um, England, New Mexico, when I lived in Guatemala, um, traveling with a border collie called Daisy, uh, living in a truck and traveling around Tennessee, going to North Carolina, riding a motorcycle across to Michigan. So it's got lots of different odds and ends. And lastly, I thought I would give you a little something by Steve Gardner. And again, it's another hiking hiking theme today. So this excerpt is going to come from Wanderlust, the best of 2019, the first anthology that we did from Wanderlust Journal. And uh, there'll be a link below. And this comes from Steve Gardner, and it's called A Moment of Truth in the Andes. I crept to the edge of the crevice and looked down. It was a narrow crack, only three feet across at the top, so I could see down 15 feet. And then the curving sides created darkness and mystery below. I glanced at the snow on the opposite side, since we were ascending. The other side was higher than where I stood. I would have to both jump out and up. It was not far, but a little awkward. I took a few steps back, made sure there was some slack in the rope, took three quick steps and leaped across the crevice. I landed solidly on the crusted snow and moved on. Ten feet later I faced another crevice. The slope we were on was a jumble of ice blocks and crevices, splitting the glacier in every direction. I jumped across that one and landed on a flat, secure area. 
It would be a good place to stop, to set up a belay and let Carl climb up behind me. Carl, I'm in a safe, good platform, I said. Come on up, the belay's on. Climbing, Carl said. I watched him wind his way up the slope, jumping over the same series of crevices I had just jumped. He moved smoothly, efficiently. I'd just met Carl two days before in the village of Juarez in the Andes Mountains of Peru. We'd agreed to climb Nevado Piso, Pisco together, but our planning did not include a route with this many challenges. The conditions on the mountain were not normal, and we'd both expressed concern about the broken nature of the glacier. Carl climbed up to the flat area and stood behind me. He took a couple of deep breaths. We were at just over 17,000 feet elevation, and so the lack of oxygen was noticeable. After a brief pause, Carl continued upward, jumping over two more crevices. And so this story goes on for a few pages. Um, it's I like it. I think he's a really good um, writer, Steve Gardner. He really brings you into it. It's very um, specific since so much the the landscape influences what they do and how they do it and Marie's version her hiking was very much the people she met um, formed what she did and where she went and that was the that was the motivation for the directions and how she moved through the space and in Sam's it was history so this and mine it was my dog because there's always a dog when you talk to me so interesting there's a nice little combination of four different stories or excerpts from four different hiking walking stories to give you hopefully the inspiration to write about your own and you can you see how it comes from any point. It can come from any point of view. It doesn't have to be one way or another. So with that in mind, I hope that you go off and you think about trips that you've taken and you want to write something up and you'll send it in and you'll contact us. All right. So that's it for day. Next week or next episode in two weeks time, we are going to be talking about food and doing food from all over the world, including some famous names and their travels and some emerging writers and theirs. So we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening in. Take care. If you'd like to find out more about either Wanderlust Journal or myself and my books, you'll find the links in the episode notes below. That's saralimi.com and wanderlust-journal.com. It's all completely free. If you're interested in supporting the Wanderlust Journal and keeping it free for everyone who wants to publish, read or hear these travel stories, there is also a link to the Buy Me A Coffee page below.